Islands are foundational to so many important cities around the world. From Paris to Guangzhou, Manhattan to Lagos, so many of the places that we choose to live as people involve islands. Islands don't just give us proximity to life-giving water, which is true of all four of the river island cities I just mentioned. They also provide us with security and a sense of independence. But I could be saying similar things about certain other geographic features like hills and rivers. What makes islands so interesting when world building? What are some of their inherent weaknesses and how do these weaknesses play in to interesting storytelling potential? What even counts as an island? All this and more in this video, so stay tuned. To start with my last question, what is an island? Generally, it is a portion of land which does not constitute its own continent and is yet surrounded on all sides by water. Greenland counts, Australia doesn't. Realistically though, for our purposes, Greenland doesn't have very many of the interesting features that make islands so very fascinating by virtue of it being so massive. So approximately the largest example I'm going to be using really is the British Isles, which is mightily convenient. The truth is the British Isles are excellent examples of many of the things that make islands quite so interesting in the first place. So we're going to use it as a jumping off point for discussing the strengths and weaknesses of island-based civilizations. For the last 8,000 years, the British Isles have been cut off from any other significant landmass, and as such, the only way to access them is by traversing one of a few different seas. When it comes to defence, this is something of a double-edged sword. While this blocks more traditional military routes of invasion, as armies can't simply walk up to our borders and start harassing us, it does provide weaknesses as well in the sense that an invasion can theoretically come from any landing point around the country. Landlocked countries and places with a lot of land borders often have those land borders protected by natural defensive resources like great rivers or mountains, which means that they can more easily predict the routes that their enemies are going to take into their territory across their land borders. This can be better defended, especially through choke points, than an entire coastline available for plunder, as uh, the Vikings found out very quickly. The existence of Britain's system of watch points and beacons around the coasts throughout history is testament to the difficult task of protecting an island from literally all sides, as is the fact that in 1066 there were three separate standing armies making their way through the country. And that was just in England. Imagine if the Scots had got involved in 1066 too. This all leads nicely to our second major feature of the island. There's not really anywhere to go. The British Isles have always been filled with a collection of people, some native, most not. From the Brigantes to the Celts, the Britons, Saxons, Angles, Picts, Jutes, and even the Romans, so many people have claimed these isles as their own. And the truth is, very few of them went anywhere. Early British history is a story of tribal conflicts and the constant shuffling of lands, except the losers couldn't really get pushed out much further after a certain point. We couldn't just send them across the border or send them somewhere else as medieval Spain liked to do. No, rather we were more stuck with our ancient enemies unless we were willing to pile them all on a collection of boats which would have cost more than just keeping them subdued in the corner of the country. Instead, absent the ability to, you know, kick our enemies out of the country, Early British history is also a history of complicated and awkward truces, occupations, 
and uprisings of the oppressed. To such an extent that even today, much of Scotland wants very little to do with Britain in general. It is also possible that being an island generally means that you are a little ahead of the game when it comes to boats, sailing and traversing water more generally, especially as islands often come in groups. Joining your neighbours on a neighbouring island is easier when you don't have to swim. Indeed, swimming is often even not a feasible alternative as it's too energy zapping and distances generally are a little too far and seas are a little too choppy to have that as a viable means of travel. It would be dull and a little much to hear, you know, extol the successes of the British Navy and the mercantile expansionism, which definitely wasn't a collection of private armies uh, exploiting vast swaths of the land um, for name of king and country. So I would instead love to point out the massively impressive history of sailing and navigation present in the Pacific Islands. The Pacific Islands produce many sailing experts and experts in star navigation as well, especially navigating the complex web of islands that uh, their homeland is. The most famous example probably is Tupaya, who accompanied Captain Cook on his famous and ill-fated journeys, making those journeys as successful as they were, not just through his navigational skills, but also through his negotiation. Tupaya is really fascinating. He's a Polynesian navigator priest who is integral to the success of this voyage, especially in his ability to negotiate with the Maori. The thing is, traversing, navigating and understanding the sea and its bounty is an absolutely necessary step for living in islands, especially in archipelago, where there are multiple islands and multiple different disparate peoples all around. With some of the special features of island living discussed, we should now probably discuss what types of island actually exist, giving a brief rundown, a discussion of what they are, what their specific features are as well. Then we're going to discuss how these unique island types can be used, moulded and made even more fascinating through the injection of fantasy tropes and a little bit of world building spice. So as brief a rundown as I can give. Continental islands can be formed when sea levels rise to cut off part of a continental crust entirely, like with Britain. Or they can cut off a piece of continental crust part of the time, forming a tidal island like Lindisfarne or Mont Saint-Michel. Continental islands can also be breakaways from a larger continental plate, like the microcontinent of Zealandia, forming New Zealand as its only point of uh, exposure on the surface, or uh, potentially just cracks in continental plates like with Madagascar, filling in with rising seawater. Other islands that are incorporated into continental plates include river islands, lake islands created by variable erosion and sediment deposits, and barrier islands. Barrier islands can be created by the mineral deposits left behind after glaciers melt. Uh, they can be coastal dunes separated from the mainland by rising sea levels, or they can be build-ups of ocean sediment brought in creating sand or silt-like barriers in front of a coastline, or made of coral in the case of a particularly large reef. Barrier islands are naturally narrow, protecting the actual mainland behind it from the sea's full force, hence barrier. Islands can also form using oceanic plates in a number of ways as well. The first comes in the interaction of continental plates and oceanic plates under the sea. Islands like Japan are formed by the subducting of oceanic plates under continental plates, creating regions of significant volcanic activity which eventually juts up, almost like how mountain ranges can be created on Earth, juts up to form a volcanic region of undersea mountains, the peaks of which form the islands. 
Volcanic regions under the sea can also build islands and mountains indeed in just simple hot spots where the crust is thinner or where more magmic activity is happening in spots like Hawaii or in places where plates are even pulling apart as opposed to moving together and subducting under one another. These places where plates are pulling apart is less about uh, releasing magma through weak spots but creating a weak spot and exposing the magma to water. Islands can also be formed of coral which climbs up structures like seamounts or climbs up itself until it breaches the surface. This forms a source of land and even when the seamount retreats it is possible that the coral atoll remains. That is what atolls generally are depositions of coral and other sediments around a volcano or seamount that is no longer there. Moving on from plate tectonics, there are some other ways that islands may appear on maps in your world. Artificial land reclamation is more common than you'd think. The 14th century uh, Mexican city of Tenochtitlan is essentially a uh, regular island that has been massively, massively artificially added to in the center of a lake, which now forms the basis of the modern day Mexico City. And it is also possible to create artificial islands out to sea as well, using similar techniques. These are much more modern projects in our world, but in a fantastical world? Well, we'll have a look. There is also the wonderful cartographical phenomenon of the Phantom Island, spotted or marked by sailors or navigators through confusion, tricks of the light, hope or belief in mythology, or simple mistakes and ink blocks on the page. The wonderful, entertaining and brilliant map men have made a video recently with more information on that. But that's enough of our basic school geography introduction. Let's talk about how to put these islands into your world. First, continents. Most of these islands only really exist because of the makeup of our world as a collection of rocks floating on hotter rocks. If you're not that bothered about plate tectonics or the kind of realism in building a fantasy world with those in mind, don't worry. Just draw maps that have islands that look kinda like our islands and you'll probably be all right. You can kind of reverse engineer the justification for most of these if you absolutely need to. Generally, bigger islands are nearer to continental land and the further you go away, the smaller the islands get. They're often also built in chains. And these chains can just be on places of volcanic activity, wherever that may be, whatever your justification might be, like Hawaii uh, and Japan. If you place a random island somewhere in the middle of the sea, oh, it's a hot spot. And if you are making a chain leading off of the mainland, try and have a peninsula leading into that uh, chain of islands as well. Just because it looks more realistic, I suppose. And remember, Oceanic islands are generally exactly the same as mountains, except you have to worry far less about whether these mountain ranges are realistic because we're only ever seeing the current tops and peaks of them in the bits that rise above the sea level. You don't have to worry about depth charts or anything like that because no fantasy map has pretty much ever included depth charts for underneath the waves. And unlike rivers and mountains, there's not a lot of rules, really, to making islands that look and feel and, and seem incredibly realistic with basically no effort on a fantasy map. That's the joy of them, really, because no one's going to be nitpicky about the shape of your particular islands. That's just how the magmic activity under the continents works. And if you don't want to bother with all that continents nonsense stuff, well then you can also have islands. They'll mostly be build-ups of sandbars and corals because seas um, in planets which don't have continents are likely to be much shallower. But now, in no particular order, we're going to make these various different types of islands fantastical. Barrier islands tend to create sheltered lagoon-style areas of water. 
less disturbed by rough ocean currents, especially the ones that hit the land with quite significant force. Especially as barrier islands are long, narrow, and not terribly useful to build a civilization on, they're often a bit crumbly, um, you're best off putting your land-based civilization behind them, using it as a shelter of a port in some degree. But an undersea civilization could make great strides in this exact environment. And if surface dwellers are using this place as a natural environment to shelter their shipping, then it's an excellent point for cultural exchange and sea taxes from the undersea locals in the sheltered back part behind the barrier island. It might be an undersea civilization's duty to maintain the barrier island in sort of a pact with the harbour port behind it. And I can imagine well a kind of sloped civilization um, moving up and just breaching the surface of the barrier island um, with these underwater amphibious peoples. Given the high levels of magic available in things like D&D settings, for example, it's also entirely possible that a cliff-top town risking, you know, crumbling into the sea due to repeated and terrible erosion may actually employ a team of earth-working mages, perhaps earth-working aquatic mages, to build an artificial barrier island. Perhaps allowing these underwater civilized folks to settle this particular new artificial barrier island, or granting a mage a kind of lighthouse style mage's tower on top of the new island as their own domain as a reward. While we're on the subject, artificial islands in a high magic setting seems an absolute no brainer. A high level mage in a land dispute with a local authority or baron or, or king may simply settle for building his own island, shaping or creating stone to form brand new land, either in view of the lands of the people he's mad at just to stick it to them further, or just in the middle of the ocean. Wall of Stone in Dungeons and Dragons would probably be one way to do this relatively quickly. Um, quick and dirty, perhaps. Perhaps the explorers of local shallows may find exposed and destroyed remains of ancient coastal stone mage islands. Indeed, in 3.5, there's an epic level spell that allows a caster to simply pull an entire island wholesale out of the sea floor. But in more general fantasy, uh, creating islands also just isn't out of the purview of powerful arch mages. Depending on how long and broad the history of your world is, it's possible that many of these islands that seem natural and kind of perfect natural paradises might actually be secretly an ancient artificial refuge for a disgruntled archmage. Speaking of artificial islands, what about fake ones, phantom islands, the one that's on your map but you can never really visit? The mythical island of Brazil off the west coast of Ireland, only visible one day every seven years and wholly, wholly unreachable, is the perfect place for this sort of grand mythology of a phantom island to begin. Perhaps it's a fey isle, visible through a misty portal, or indeed a, a land beyond, a view of an afterlife to come, or a land of the immortals like in Tolkien's work. The thing is, in fantasy there is so much scope for islands that move, or are unseen, Cloaking spells, transportation magic for whole islands, or indeed magically buoyant islands that float and drift along the currents of the world, they're all possibilities, and, and so is the idea of an island which is simply people living on the back of a great turtle. Phantom islands would likely be a relatively common feature of many fantasy maps, not just because someone made a mistake or saw something they weren't supposed to, but perhaps because the island was absolutely, definitely, definitively there 
the timer navigator saw it first and marked it on his map. And with the fact that maps just get copied and copied and passed down and passed down until somebody bothers to check, this could be a real problem for fantasy cartographers. You can actually probably expect many of the smaller islands dotted around fantasy maps to have this exact sort of problem. Some navigator saw the back of a great draconic turtle, perhaps, some many miles away and noted it down, described it in brief, and drew a little image on their map, which then got reproduced. And imagine that thousands of times, sightings of dragon turtles simply slumbering in the water creates an entire network of mythical phantom islands, of course. You could also invert that and have literal phantom islands, which sounds pretty terrifying. Speaking of islands created by weird and wonderful creatures, coral islands are certainly our next topic. These and atolls generally give rise to some of the strangest shaped oceanic islands of them all. Perhaps rings formed in this way of living coral may be the only place of transition between uh, here and the next place. Maybe uh, the Fey Realms, or the Plain of Oceans, or, you know, the Moon. And certainly, communities of amphibious or sea-dwelling people may find an awful lot of shelter and respite in the protection that a toll grants from the seas outside, especially as they're so often just in the middle of nowhere. It's entirely possible that an atoll ring island forms an oasis of sorts for undersea travellers. As coral reefs famous for having plenty of fish, plenty of light and shallows, and they're relatively safe from the cold abyss, perhaps even warm if there's still a little bit of uh, resultant volcanic activity from the sea mount that the atoll was once uh, poking out of the sea with. It's possible that such a place might be an aspirational goal to reach for sea dwellers, like uh, sort of Timbuktu or El Dorado. And I can imagine a, a really, really isolated community surviving for generations in this sort of environment with little to no news of the outside world, perhaps a sort of land lost to time except an undersea civilization, a true Atlantis, if you will. I also can't get the idea of this idyllic state of affairs turned on its head in something like the modern day bikini atoll, which mm, I suppose Spongebob is kind of the closest we get to that. But this could really work for many islands. Islands are the perfect, the quintessential testing site for, I mean, alongside deserts, for ancient magic or ancient weaponry that twists, shapes and destroys those who use it and those who are left behind under the seas after all has blown to dust. Perhaps the ancient mage who chose this abandoned ring in the middle of nowhere as the focus for his mass weapon of magic never imagined for one second that there would ever be people who chose to live there, or people already living there under the ocean. Finally, we're going to turn to the most habitable islands for surface dwellers specifically. Our river and lake islands, our breakaway islands, and our island chains. These are the types of islands for which our historical concepts from the very start of the video are the most relevant. Coastal defences, conquest and naval power are all useful considerations, especially if wind magic can aid in navigation, sailing, and the accuracy of one's wayfinding. It is also true that the highest point of an island is an incredible watch point, not just for watching the stars, which would make it a perfect place for a mage's uh, or astronomer's laboratory, but also for defence, as you can't really hide an advancing flotilla moving across empty ocean towards your island. And indeed, there's no rest of the mountain range to get in the way of a 
airborne threat coming towards you either. The only real exception to this is if the enemy's underwater, in which case, good luck. But this video would be incredibly overlong if we went fully into the implications of warfare on island defence. Thankfully, that is exactly what we're going to be discussing in next week's video, the second half of this island extravaganza. For now, let's just deal with some of the cool themes that we can explore in fantasy using the more habitable surface-dwelling kinds of island. Much like Tenochtitlan, our earthworking mages can likely make viable islands from the smallest of protrusions in the centres of rivers and lakes. This provides excellent fertile land and creates your own natural moat without having to dig it out, which is still an incredibly useful thing in fantasy. The fewer viable routes there are into your city or fortification, the easier it is to screen for shape changes, invisible enemies, smugglers, tax dodgers, toll dodgers, and monsters. Doesn't really help you against a dragon though. But before we deal with dragons, it is also worth noting that bridges might actually be easier to raise in fantasy worlds with the aid of magic than in our own real world. With the aid of magically created stone, for example, or turning uh, clay structures into stone through alchemy or all sorts of different magical means, it could be pretty easy to develop a fairly quick and efficient bridge as long as you've got shallow enough ground and solid enough foundations. This might mean that island chains end up significantly more interconnected, not having to rely on significant uh, creation of cranes and all those sorts of things if they can use a mage instead, not having to ship things over for construction projects, but using in-house magical work instead. It could be that these island chains get better connected than ever before, than we see really in our world, across the land at least. It's also possible that breakaway islands can be connected to the mainland more easily. Perhaps if this world were transfigured into a fantasy one, perhaps there would already be a bridge across the entire English Channel. Although, thinking about that, 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 that would be a pretty long bridge. Maybe not. Volcanic islands like Hawaii might be an absolutely brilliant fantasy locale for a collection of dwarves. High forts, visible sightlines across the entire outer realm, and an active bubbling pool of magma with which to forge and heat and temper metals. It's, it's a kind of a dwarf's dream to live on a volcanic island nation on their own. Another thing is that the, the shape, size, and general layout of islands are also incredibly important, so we can't get too carried away on any one of these particular ideas. If you do like one of them, make an island that suits it, or put it onto an island that suits that sort of style. For the Dwarven Forge volcano idea, I'm imagining kind of a, a huge peak above the sea, um, with fortress around the caldera of the still active volcano and lush grasslands sweeping out into rocky cliffs from which the dwarves can see all of that they own and watch for any sort of advances. That's probably the sort of island that would fit that bill the most, but play around. But we must also return to one of our first points, which is about the difficulty in escaping. Islands have great defensive benefits, but they pose a massive, massive risk to their inhabitants, more so than any other civilized land type in fantasy. If a dragon comes, burns or destroys your boats and bridges, and installs itself as the ruler of your island, there is nothing you can do. There is nowhere else to go but to slay the dragon. That's your only way out. Especially in lower magic settings, the idea of a giant flying lizard torching your only means of escape and setting up shop on the only land that is visible for miles is quite terrifying and would almost instantly create a significant underclass and servitude for this dragon. It's a ready-made empire. 
When your civilization is pretty much entirely reliant on a single form of transportation to leave, and your borders are literally impassable, not just legally or socially, when there is a second threat, another claimant to your island, be it devilish invasion dragon or invasion by amphibious sea monsters, your options may simply be to assimilate or die. Your only hope in that case is a mage willing to teleport as many of you out as possible, building boats in the night and hoping that your new overlords don't notice, or maybe, just maybe, hoping that a band of three to six individuals group up and go off to slay whatever threat is oppressing you. But on that cheery note, it's time to end, for now. Stay tuned for the next video where we're going to look at some examples of how islands can be ruled, conquered and controlled and used by surface dwellers who tend to inhabit them. Let me know what other topics in this space I should be taking a look at and if you enjoyed the video please do the YouTube things, I'm sure you know what they are by now. But with all that said, I've been Tom, otherwise known as the Grungeon Master. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video.